So today what I want to do is talk a little bit about linear momentum and impulse. I have created a couple days ago an angular momentum and impulse uh, discussion, but I think this is kind of important. So what I'll try and do is first of all define impulse and momentum, connect it back to Newton's second law, and then also how to use it, but also how, how to choose among the many different ways you've been looking at these problems how do you choose which is the correct way to solve a particular problem? We already know that Newton's second law relates force to acceleration instantaneously. And so you, you often have the kid on the swing, you solve for various terms, and it's, it's great, um, but it's not always the best way to solve a problem. And you saw that when you looked at the previous sorts of lectures discussing work energy where we solve problems over a defined distance we didn't look at it instantaneously just at x1 x2 s1 s2 it'd be useful to have a method to look at relating forces to the change in velocity occurring over a finite time interval so say for example you have something occurring from t1 to t2 you have impulse and momentum and that's where we're going today so We'd like to, what I'd like to do today is talk about that kind of problem. So in the diagram here, you see a, you see two part or two points on, of motion, one at time one and another one at time two. There's a force associated with it and a velocity associated with it. So MV1, or I'm going to call it MV1 for now. Well, we can start with Newton's second law, and that's force equals ma. And if you do that, you can integrate over time one to time two of each of the terms. And if you do that, you can say, well, f, um, f dt from t1 to t2 is t1 t2 m d a dt. And recognize that a dt is dv. So if you do that, you can make a substitution. And the substitution becomes these terms I drew in my diagram below and didn't explain up till now, which are the momentum terms. So uh, the integral from time one to time two of force is going to be mv2 minus mv1. I still have to, unlike work energy, I've got to worry about direction. So I don't have direction disappearing. So these are vector terms that I, I'm looking at here. So using the notation in the book, which I will regret in a few slides, the linear momentum or simply momentum of a particle is G equals MV. It has dimensions of mass times length over time, SI units kilogram meter second uh, per second or Newton seconds. US customary units slug feet per second and pound force seconds. You need to sort of know what they are. You don't necessarily need to use them. So the linear impulse of a force is going to occur over time. So here's a graph uh, from time one to time two of force. This green line is the very time varying force. I'm too lazy to draw nice curved lines. And the shaded area is that integral. So by integrating under that curve, I get the linear impulse. So if you integrate Newton's second law over the interval from time one to time two, you end up with this term right here. So F, which is F dt is integrated from T1 to T2 is G2 minus G1. And so you have the linear impulse or momentum at time one, you have the linear momentum at time two, and all of this is caused by the impulse from T1 to T2. And that's the integral form, and you're going to use that a lot in this course. Particles change in momentum over an interval of time is equal to the impulse imparted to that particle during the same time interval. So uh, when, you, when you look at the, the text uh, and numerous texts, 
you often see that dynamics authors either play baseball or golf uh, and often look at hitting balls for very short periods of time. And, and that's kind of important to understand that that's a great way to talk about. It's actually a really great way to talk about uh, momentum. And we can write that as force is equal to g dot, which is the linear momentum, uh, time rate of change of linear momentum, which equals mv dot, which is ma. If we want to look at the average force, we can take the integral and divide it by the time interval over which it occurs, so delta t. And this red line here represents that average force. And sometimes it's better to take average force because it sort of conveys the same information, and often actually it does, uh, and especially in this course. So between these two blue lines, you see what the average force is. The average for force in terms of momenta is going to be g2 minus g1 time derivatives over the delta t of that time. And that's just really applying that equation that we had just a moment. If you have impulse momentum for a closed system of particles, you have three particles, for example, m1, m2, m3. You have the center of mass of that particle, of those particles, which is g. And you can define the distances uh, r1, r2, r3 to each of the particles. You can also define the distance to the center of mass, rg. Each of the particles will have their own separate sort of velocity, v1, v2, v3. And each of them will interact with the environment uh, through internal forces, f12 to f21, for example, f13 onto f31, f23 onto f32. There'll be external forces applying to each of those particles, and I'm just summing them up, F1, F2, and F3. And here I have a, a closed system of particles. I probably should mention that there's going to be a V sub G on this. F sub I is the total external force on particle I. So those are all of the external forces. F sub I J is the total internal forces and the impulse momentum of the individual or all each individual particle is going to be the external forces plus the sum of all the internal forces, which equals to uh, DDT of linear momentum. Now you can see where my problem is because I've got G for my center of mass here and I have G for my linear momentum. You can blame the text that I'm using this uh, particular notation. So, Sum of forces, total external forces, total momentum have to be the sum of all of the individual uh, forces acting on the body. Newton's third law tells me all of the internal forces are going to cancel. F, uh, little f, 1, 3, it cancels with f, 3, 1, etc. through all this thing. Summing over the entire system, I get some, uh, all forces equals g dot, the time rate of change of the center of mass. And I can write that G is equal to MVG and F is equal to MAG. And again, don't make the mistake of having uh, mixing up these two terms. It's confusing and I understand it's confusing. It's not much I can do about it because we, we do need to remain consistent with the text. Integrating both sides of the impulse momentum principle, you get uh, T1 to T2, FTT, which is G2 minus G1. Again, this is the initial system momentum. And this is the final. system momentum. This is the impulse of all external forces on the system. So let's take a, a standard case, which is say two billiard balls come together. And I can define an axis that is tangent, which is B right here, and A, which acts along the line of impact. A free body diagram of the eight ball during impact is shown here. I have all of the external forces acting on it. There's nothing, I'm ignoring friction, so there's no forces that are going to cause anything, but the free body diagram of both balls during impact show nothing is happening. 
because everything is internal force to the system of ball three and ball eight. B axis is tangent to the impact surface. A axis is the one perpendicular to that surface. The only force acting on the AB plane acting on the eight ball is directed along the A axis, and there is no net external force on the balls taken together. Now, this is one of those tricky things that you, you do have to spend a bit of time thinking about it. And when you do, it, it's, it's not that bad. But um, the important point here is that this is a zero impulse, not because it necessarily has to take place over zero time. That's another question. Uh, and you'll see examples of these when you when you go into uh, the various uh, practical videos. Total momentum of the system uh, of the two ball system is conserved during impact. T1 is the time right before, T2 is the right after, so G1 equals G2. So putting in all the terms, I can calculate everything from beginning to end. So uh, momentum of ball three plus momentum of ball eight at time one equals momentum of ball three and momentum of ball eight at time two. Conservation of momentum between time one and time two. This is always going to be the case of an isolated system, which does not interact with its surrounding. This is actually kind of something I should sort of do more often, which is sort of how do you solve kinetic particle kinetic problems? Um, you're given a whole bunch of different sort of solute approaches. I mean, we've talked about Newton's second law, we will be talking, there's a separate video on uh, angular momentum, uh, linear momentum, and work energy. But if you have forces and accelerations, it's a Newtonian mechanics problem, second law. Uh, forces, displacement, and velocity, you have work energy. Forces, time, and velocity, you have linear impulse momentum. But if I switch to moments, time, and velocity, I have angular impulse momentum. It's really crucial, at, and part of the study that I would strongly recommend as you're preparing for, for the various exams in the course is to look at um, what exactly is required to solve each of the problems that you have. So a relatively quick sort of discussion today, just define linear impulse momentum and overview of how to choose a solution methodology. Thank you very much, and we'll talk again.